hello everyone. Uh, my name is Margie Urban and I'm here at the New York State Clinical Education Initiative Sexual Health Center of Excellence Annual Conference. And I'm happy to be here uh, with my friend Rona Vale. Uh, this is Dr. Rona Vale, who is an uh, HIV specialist who practices in New York City at uh, the Cal and Lord Health Center and is also the principal author of the very recently released New York State um, AIDS Institute PrEP guidelines. So uh, welcome, Rona. Thanks so much for joining me for this quick chat. Thanks for having me here. So I just wanted to um, uh, take a minute to, to just talk to you about the guidelines that are uh, new as of May 20th of 2022. So that's actually a pretty quick turnaround because the last iteration of, of those guidelines, which I believe you were also principal author, right, for the, for the last time, was February of 2020. So uh, I'm assuming, you know, I, I know there, there's lots that's happened in the field, and um, maybe you could just fill us in on, on what your charge was to take this on as a full revision so quickly. Sure. Um, yes, you're right. Two years is, you know, most guidelines have a life that's longer than two years, but PrEP continues to evolve. And in uh, December of 2021, we had the approval of yet a third drug uh, for use um, for PrEP, which is long-acting injectable cabotegravir, which there's a lot of excitement about, but there's also a lot of important information to be shared about that choosing different, reg like now that we have three drugs, how do we choose between them? who is which drug appropriate for, and just sort of the clinical decisions and how to just go about even making the choices around PrEP, given this third option, and a third option that has some complexity to it. Yeah, yeah. It really has. I mean, it started as a pretty simple algorithm when we only had one choice and, and mm -hmm. pretty strict criteria, and now there's, there's a lot of uh, things to weigh. I felt like going through the guidelines, we both sit on the committee that, that reviews these guidelines, and I was really impressed uh, with this iteration of how helpful it is to a practicing clinician. There, there are a number of tables that um, you can really just say, this is my question, and I'm going to take a look at the table and weigh the options, and even weigh the options with your patient um, so right. that you can have some shared decision making. Yeah, I think as it gets more complicated in terms of choices and limitations and benefits of each of these drugs, having side-by-side -side tables that really helps to spell that out for people who aren't doing this every day the way you and I are, but that you know are, are have a patient and and just want to help make the best choice for them. How do I choose? Is is a one drug um, appropriate or not appropriate, or all three drugs appropriate? If so, well, what are the the pluses and minuses of each drug? And having a table that lists all of those things uh, can be super helpful, I think, for a practicing clinician trying to make those choices, mm -hmm. as well as tables around monitoring and follow-up and all of that. Yeah. Have you gotten any feedback already? I mean, it's only been at the time we're, we're recording this, not even two weeks. <laughs> not even two weeks. Um, I, I've gotten some feedback, um, not, uh, nothing negative to date, which is always helpful. Um, some good feedback about the really happy that this has come out now and happy to have um, these kinds of uh, uh, details uh, to help make decisions around this. Uh -huh. How about, um, I, I know there's some differences with some other guidelines that have come out. Like, I don't know if you want to just give us a little bit of a framework of, of where those differences lie. Sure, I mean, I think um, everybody knows the CDC came out with updated guidelines at the end of last year, which are very good and very comprehensive. Um, they actually, their guidelines came out before cabotegravir was actually approved. And so I think their guidelines around cabotegravir are a little bit more limited. I think we go into a much fuller discussion about cabotegravir and, and relating it to the other medications and some how-tos around it. But uh, there's also some differences. There's some key differences in monitoring. Uh, one, for instance, is uh, we're very strongly recommending that people get a viral load, HIV viral load at baseline before initiating PrEP, because we know that the majority of like, there's a high percentage of people, if you don't find out that they had HIV at baseline, if you only do an HIV antigen antibody test and they were actually in acute HIV and you don't get a viral load and you only give them two drugs for PrEP, that they're the ones who are gonna fail with resistance. And so if we really wanna avoid failure with resistance, being absolutely sure that they're not seroconverting at baseline, uh, the CDC does recommend 
doing a risk analysis of recent exposure. But in our experience, not everybody's comfortable telling a provider that they've had a risk exposure, either an injection exposure or a sexual exposure in the last month. Uh, that you know, it, 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 there people are afraid of judgment, and just let's just get rid of that as an issue and just get the test. Mm -hmm. And so we recommend everybody get a viral load at baseline. Um, on the other side, uh, the CDC recommends getting a viral load at every monitoring visit, visit for oral prep as well as for cabotegravir. Um, we don't recommend, and I think there, we're not the only ones who are concerned about why that changed. We've been using oral prep for a very long time without viral loads. We see very few failures. When we see failure, there are very few that actually have resistance. And that resistance is usually a 184 mutation, which doesn't affect our choices of antivirals if somebody seroconverts and has to go on antivirals. And that's different from integrase resistance. So we are not advocating getting viral loads uh, at every visit for oral prep, only if there's been a break in treatment uh, of more than a week in potential exposures during that time. Okay. And I noticed, you know, you know that my my background is particularly sexual health and STIs, and, and that those recommendations really have remained um, pr pretty much intact. Is that yeah, we actually recommend more frequent monitoring than the CDC does uh, for all groups. And you know, you can individualize that for sure, but we feel like the default should just be every three months STI screening for all, because we know that the way to actually curb STI rates is to test, just test, 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 test uh, asymptomatic people. We have folks coming into care who are sexually active. Let's STI screen them. You could always choose to screen less often if somebody's really not at very high risk. You know, monogamous with an HIV partner and wants the extra protection of PrEP on top of U equals U, you know, that's a low risk person for STIs, but, uh, or other, you know, there's other situations like that. But I think as a default, we should be doing more frequent screening, not less frequent screening. Right. Well, you, you know, all the rates are rising. So, uh, oh, exactly. Testing, exactly. Of um, right. So, to my view, well, we, we just want this to be sort of a short introduction and, mm -hmm. and really encourage people to go to hivguidelines.org where you can find uh, the new version of the PrEP guidelines. And you'll also find actually helpful slide sets if you want to go over the guidelines with your staff, if you're in a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the actual full text is, is downloadable. But and um, the checklist as well. There's, yeah. I think, a helpful clinician checklist that's actually like foldable that you can carry in your pocket. That uh, so when you come again across a patient that you want to discuss prep, you have all of the really basics there: what tests you have to order, what the different drugs are, et cetera. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so I, I guess in summary, really, in my view, that they're, they're really a um, fantastic document for actual patient care. For it's it's not it's not entirely theoretical. It's uh, very useful in the real world setting. And um, yeah, I think kudos to you. I mean, it's really a beautifully written document and uh, hopefully will we'll lead to more PrEP uptake and, and less HIV in our world, right? That's the thing. That's absolutely the thing.